So we're in Joshua chapter 5. And uh, uh, recall from last week, of course, that uh, they've, crossed, uh, they've crossed the Jordan, and uh, now they're over in, in Canaan land. One of the things that we didn't do in this study, because I'm, I'm just doing topical portions out of the book of Joshua, we didn't spend any time in chapter 2 looking at uh, the spies going to the house of Rahab in, uh, in Jericho. And of course, you probably know that story, so I'm not going to go through all that right now. But I find it very interesting the way that was handled. You know, we think of uh, these spies who were sent out. Joshua has experience with, with spies being sent out since he was part of those, uh, that group of 12 spies that were sent out, you know, 20 or 38 years earlier. And um, so he sends them out quietly, privately. It's not a big public to do. 12 spies aren't sent out, just two spies, like maybe. Maybe he knows from his experience that two spies are better than 12, uh, based upon you know, what uh, he and the others had experienced before. And they go to the house of a harlot named Rahab. I find it interesting what they learn there. You know, if you, if you look at this, why do you send spies into an area? You send spies into an area to get military intelligence, to find out how you're going to take that city, all these things. These spies went in. Uh, they do all of the things you would not expect spies to do, except to hide. And, and the information they get has no military value, per se. Uh, there's only one thing that they accomplished, and that was the saving of Rahab and her family. And why is that important? Because you and I wouldn't be here today had it not been for Rahab and her family being saved, because she's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Fascinating part of, of uh, the book of Joshua. And we read here, actually, just for, you know, for a little review in chapter 2, verse 1, now Joshua, son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went, they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. And we read this, if we just skip to verse 9 for a moment, um, Rahab said to the men, now think about this, she's a Canaanite, She's a harlot. She lives on the wall in Jericho, and she would be probably, from your standpoint or mine, the least likely to be someone who cares at all about the God of Israel. But what we learn from her is what the, all of the Canaanites, not just those in Jericho, but those throughout the land of Canaan, what they're thinking about this group of two and a half, three million people who've now entered into uh, Canaan, or about to enter into Canaan at this point. She said, I know, Rahab says, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Really? How would she know that? I know that, and I know that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God. This is Rahab the harlot, a Canaanite. The Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. I don't know if you realize just how revolutionary a statement that is. Not only, and I know I've only said it about four times now, but she's a Canaanitess. Uh, she's a harlot. She lives here in, uh, in Jericho. She's saying these things, but she's speaking really on behalf of everybody else, not just the, the tens of thousands who may live within those walls of Jericho, but of the millions who lived throughout the land of Canaan, that we all know these things. We know about the, you know about the plagues that decimated Egypt. We know how the Lord delivered you out of there. We know how those plagues destroyed the social structure, the economic structure, and the entire military uh, of, and the power of Egypt. We know how the Lord opened up the Red Sea that you crossed over on dry ground. We know that the Lord completely destroyed Pharaoh and his army. We know that the Lord has led you for 40 years by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they know this? After all, there are people who are moving back and forth between northern Africa and, and this area, what we would call Israel today, but Canaan. They travel back and forth. They, you know, these are people who trade and, and they travel for various reasons. So that information 
would easily travel back and forth, if nothing else, military intelligence between the different tribes and the city-states throughout the, that area. So all of this information has been passed around. Now look, it's important, you understand. There were giants in, in not, the land of, not only the land of Canaan, but also over in Moab and those areas. So when she says, we know about the two kings you destroyed, Sihon, you know, the king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan, these are giants. Understand, the reason that Jericho is such a highly fortified city is because they were freaked out by the giants that were in the land. They have 50-foot walls. I mean, the archaeology, I'm not going to get into it this morning, but the archaeology of the area was clear. I mean, uh, Kathleen Kenyon and Gerstang did their work back in the, uh, the early 60s. Some of the greatest uh, work on, on Jericho happened then. These walls, anywhere from 40 to 50 feet high, double walls, an outside and an inner wall, uh, and, and in many cases 12 to 15 foot thick, huge fortifications. Why? Because Og king of Bashan, Sihon king of the Amorites, they, these people terrorized those in, uh, in Canaan, and now here come these Israelites who wipe them out. Well, they know that, and, and you know, we, we talk about people who were uh, agnostic or atheist today. If you told anybody back in the ancient world there was no God, they'd have killed you. Because everybody knew there was a God. And their view of gods is that gods were local. Right? So kind of like, uh, like, like if you traveled from one area to the other, they wouldn't expect that your God would travel with you very far. If you think of you, know, you tune into an FM station, and you drive from one city to the other. You drive from Philadelphia down toward um, Washington, D.C. Somewhere along the line, you're going to lose that station, and you're going to have to find what you were listening to on another station. That's the, kind of the way it was with their gods. The gods were local. And, but what does she say? Something really powerful. Your God, he is God, over heaven above and earth beneath. That is a sweeping revolutionary statement that you really wouldn't expect from almost anybody. And whether it's prejudiced or not, you wouldn't expect it from a harlot. You would think she's got other things on her mind. But, uh, but, but what do they learn? There's no military intelligence they get, except that they're all freaked out. But she says, make me this deal. I'll hide you, but you save me when you come through. We know that, that you're going to wipe us out, or I know that, that you guys are going to wipe us out. Save me and save my family. They make her a deal. And what's the deal? You hang this blood red cord, this scarlet cord from your window so that we know where to go when we come and we will save you, you have our word. And, uh, and so that's the way that they leave it. Now, the days, days ago, as we move to chapter five, they crossed the Jordan. And here they are now in this place called Gilgal. Gilgal is about two miles away from Jericho. And, and, and what are they thinking? You know, they, they're... they're the, the Israelites are in, are in Gilgal. I often wonder what those in Jericho were thinking. I, I alluded to this briefly last week. But those in Jericho, as they saw millions now, two, two and a half, three million Israelites on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and they see that the pillar of cloud goes away. Now what are they thinking? That's their God. Their God just left them. What's that shiny box? And, 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 and they figured there's no way they can get across, but the moment they step into the river, it dries up and piles up like a mountain 20 miles north of there. So what is that shiny box? Is that their God? Do they hold their God in that box? These are pagans. They don't know what to think. You and I wouldn't know what to think, except we have a Bible to explain these things to us. They're wondering those things. The Israelites are now over on the, what, we, what, what, what the news likes to call the West Bank nowadays. They're over there, two miles away from Jericho. And we read this, chapter 5, verse 1. We read, So it was, when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Um, I suppose it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyhow. It's not good when your heart melts. It's just not good when your heart melts for fear. And when there's no longer any spirit in you. No, in other words, no sense of strength, vision, purpose, any of that. Um, and, and that's a pretty 
pretty powerful statement. Maybe some people haven't really experienced that before, but I think we've all experienced at least some aspect of that before, where we say, is it worth it? Why don't I give up? Some of you may be feeling that even today about something. You know, so easy uh, during these last couple of months to keep talking about the coronavirus, and that's a, that's a very real issue in our society, not just the virus, but the, the government's response to that and, and the, result, the resulting effect that that has had on each one of your lives and my life, life of our church. You know, we can make fun jokes, you know, I mean, well-intended jokes uh, about, you know, we use live stream and, you know, you're not sitting here, but I can kind of imagine your faces and all that sounds cute enough, but, uh, or the fact that you're sitting in your jammies eating your, your cornflakes and you're with banana on top or whatever it is that you're eating, that's great. But at some point we have to say, but yes, that's not church. And we want to get back together again. And I realize that some people, whether through illness or fear thereof, um, experience a lot of fear. I know people, Christians and non-Christians, who are experiencing a great deal of fear, who take this so seriously, and we should take it seriously, don't misunderstand, but take it so seriously that it, it threatens us, it, it, it paralyzes us. And paralysis is a, it's not the Lord. Paralysis that comes from fear is not the Lord. The fear of the Lord produces worship, the pr fear of the Lord produces humility. The fear of the Lord generates action in our lives, obedience in our lives, not paralysis. Paralysis that comes from fear is a paralysis that's coming from our flesh or from our enemy. And I know that many people are paralyzed by that right now or held captive by some fortification. It doesn't have to be the coronavirus. It doesn't have to be the, the loss of a job, as difficult as those things are. It doesn't have to be something like that. It can be the fortification of the, or big walls that have been built by your spouse, uh, built big walls that have been built by, uh, by an adult child, and, and, and now you've lost communication. Now, there, are, there are these walls that, that come from addiction, the walls that come for, from uh, immorality, pornography, adultery, those types of things in our lives. Their walls, and God, the Bible shouts it out so clearly, God wants to take down those walls. He wants to bring down their, these walls. So when we walk through this study in, in Joshua 5 and 6, there's a lot here in terms of application. But now is the time, I believe, to prepare for action, because God is about, I, I'm convinced, that God is about to do something in our midst. By that I mean in your family, by that I mean in this country, and by that I mean in this church. God does nothing without purpose. All things he does are with purpose. That everything that happens in our lives, God uses for his purposes, which are ultimately for our good to conform us into the image of his son. And I'll say it now, but we'll get into it more later. You are in the middle of a spiritual battle right now. Spiritual warfare. You say, no, I'm not. I saw the exorcist. No one's spewing pea soup. There's no booey-wooey stuff going on in my life right now. And I think that's one of the saddest and greatest misunderstandings of the spiritual walk and spiritual warfare, is what we've allowed Hollywood to portray about what the devil, our enemy, what he does to discourage us in our lives. In fact, I just said it. Discouragement is one of the greatest weapons of the enemy. Disheartening is what that means. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see that more. But what we're about to look at here is spiritual battle. How do they take Jericho? And by the way, why did they need to take Jericho? I think that's important for us to understand because God has said, you're going into the land. I gave you this land. I promised it to your forefather Abraham 430 years ago and, and reiterated it to Isaac and to Jacob and to Joseph and to all of the patriarchs of Israel this land is yours. And, and he brings them in. Interesting, if you look at it on a map, he brought them into the center of the country. And there's Jericho right in front of them, one of the probably the most fortified of all of the city-states in the land of Canaan. 
And God strategically, this is not Joshua, God says, you take that first. And then once they've divided the land by taking Jericho, now they move to the north, and then they move to the south, and they end up taking Canaan from there. It's very strategic, but it's a, it's a spiritual battle. Each one of these fortified cities, just as each one of those fortifications in our own minds sometimes, or fortifications in our lives in general, are spiritual strongholds that need to be taken down, and they only get taken down when we allow the Lord to do that. And to do that requires first preparation. So what, let's look at this, beginning in verse 2 of chapter 5. And so at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourselves and, and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. The second time, what does he mean? It's been 40 years. The last time there was a circumcision was when they were in Egypt. Now they've been in the wilderness for 40 years. The Exodus generation has died off. These are the children of the Exodus generation, and they have not been circumcised. No time to go into the whys of that right now, but it's important that that we understand that. So we're not talking about 50 men or 100 men or 1,000 men. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of men, who are not eight days old, by the way, who are being circumcised. And uh, I'll let... You in your own homes, settle out, you know, figure that one out for yourselves. But now they're going to be circumcised. And God says, circumcise them the second time. And so Joshua made flint knives for himself, and he circumcised the sons of Israel um, at, at the hilt of the foreskins, at the hill of the foreskins. And, and this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, that would be about, six, give or take, 600,000 fighting men. We read in Numbers 26. All of those men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they came out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. That would be at Kadesh Barnea. And then Joshua, verse 7, he circumcised uh, their sons whom he had raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they'd not been circumcised on the way. And so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people, they stayed in their places in the camp until they were healed. It was time for healing, obviously. And uh, the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. From you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Gilgal means a rolling. So um, all of that's quite interesting. We read uh, as, you, as you move down here that on the 14th of the day that month, they, um, they celebrated Passover also for the first time since they were in Egypt. So this is the second time they've had a Passover. And, and they ate of the pr- produce of the land on that day. Remember, they've been eating. This is amazing. You think of the, the miracle of the manna that they had in the wilderness every day for six days a week for all of those years. And just as miraculous as the giving of that manna is now the sudden disappearance of that manna. So they eat of the, of the grain of the land, we read. Um, and, 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 and then the manna ceased on the day after they'd eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. I find it interesting, you know, all the things that they could be doing right now in terms of taking Jericho. Remember what happened before they crossed the Jordan. What does the Lord say? Take three days. Don't do a thing. Consecrate yourselves. In other words, get yourself ready for what you're about to do. Because crossing the Jordan is not just a matter of, of crossing a river. It's a spiritual venture. I think sometimes we don't realize just how spiritual are the ventures God calls us to. This is a spiritual venture. I've given you this land. Now you have to cross this in an improbable crossing. I mean, face it, you know, the, the, the Jordan at flood stage, that's as improbable. I guess not improbable. It's impassable. It's impossible to, to cross over that river. But God says, I'm going to do it. And of course, we know the rest. They, they cross over on dry ground. Now here they are, and God has them wait yet again. There are all these waiting periods. I find those fascinating. God wants us to wait. I wonder if we wonder sometimes, why is it that we're waiting in our homes? Now we can say, well, the politician said we have to. Governor Wolf says we have to. Okay, fair enough. But what are we doing while we're waiting is the real question. Because 
God has given us that opportunity. Much as we may not like being quarantined or, or, or told or asked to, to stay at home, what are we doing with that time? See, God wants them to do something with that time. So in this case, he says circumcise. I don't want anybody doing anything else until they're circumcised. Why? Because circumcision is, is, is a token of the covenant that they're under. It's a picture of that they are the Lord's. And then he says, I know, and you need to heal, and you need to, to rest up. And I want you to worship. So, so to, to consecrate ourselves, to rest, and to worship the Lord. You know, those are healthy things for us to remember as well. Not just waiting until Sunday morning to see it on live stream, but to actually spend daily time with the Lord. Because in those times of rest and, and, and of healing, of consecration, in those times of worship, that's when we hear from the Lord we know what he really wants us to do. And so, so, so here they are. And by the way, let's just get, get some perspective. Jericho is from Gilgal, about two miles. And, and Jericho itself is estimated by most people to have covered. Now, this is, a, this is a walled city that would have covered about 10 acres. So if you have some sen- sense of a, an acre, uh, I always forget the exact number of square feet, but you know, uh, some people really know it exactly. You know, people in real estate and engineering usually know the answer to that, but I call it in the 41,000 square foot range. I'll get emails. But anyhow, um, about 41,000 square feet, 10 acres. So this is a pretty big area, and you have, you have tens of thousands of people living in there. And, and here's Joshua, a, a, an, an excellent general, and, and he's out looking for, for intelligence. He, wants to, he knows what he has to do. Now, how is he going to do it? Verse 13, we read something, and, and there's a lot here, actually. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold. Actually, before I go any further... He lifted up his eyes. You do the study yourself. You do the study yourself. But I promise you, you will mine gold if you do this. Take a, take a like, especially a computerized uh, concordance, like blueletterbible.org, and, and type in the phrase, lifted up his eyes. You'll find it 20 times in your Bible. Lifted up his eyes. And every single time that the Bible says someone lifted up their eyes, something big happens after that. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and behold, there was a ram caught in the thicket. Uh, Isaac lifted up his eyes, and behold, he saw camels bringing Rebekah, his, his new bride. You can start to go through all the times that the Bible says lifted up his eyes. Um, and and you, you study it for yourself. But there are some others. I like the one where Jesus says to the disciples in John chapter 4, lift up your eyes, for behold, the fields are white unto harvest. Do you realize Right in your neighborhood right now, the fields are white to harvest. Just lift up your eyes. And Jesus says, when you see these things coming to pass on the earth, then lift up your eyes, for behold, your redemption is drawing near. God never disappoints. There are some very difficult things going on in our world right now. If only we would lift up our eyes and we would see that things are about to change big time. Our redemption is drawing near. Jesus is coming back for us very soon. So verse 13, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, there was a man who stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua, I mean, he's like a sentry. I, I love the guy. I mean, he's, oh, he's 100 years old at this point, so he's not like a kid, okay? But he's, he, he's like a sentry. He just goes right up to him, and he challenges him. He says, are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? And the man said, no. Like, that wasn't one of the options. Like, what kind of an answer is that? No. He said, no. But as the captain or as the commander of the Lord's host, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face. To get that, Joshua understood exactly who he was talking to. This is not an angel. He knew exactly who he was speaking to. This is, see, the, the, the theologians like to use the big words, a theophany. Or if you prefer, a Christophany. This is Christ pre-incarnate. Here's Joshua, whose name is Jesus, meeting Jesus. Is Jesus standing there? You get that? Here's Jesus standing there. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm not for you or for your enemies. We, we always want to know if, if, if God's on our side. The question is, are we on his side? He's not a, it's not a question of whether he's on our side. He's on the side of his will. He already has a plan. The question is whether we're into that, if we get his will, if we're in agreement with these things. 
No, he says, but as the captain of the Lord's host, I've come, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he worshipped, and he said to him, what does my Lord have to say to his servant? What do you have to say to me? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you now stand is holy ground. Joshua understood, and he worshipped there. These next two verses, this is not just a translational preference. This is exactly what it says in the Hebrew. Now Jericho. You know, I think sometimes, uh, and I realize what it means. It, it means, now this is what Jericho was like, and this is how it was fitted out, and this is how it was fortified, and this is what it was like inside. But you know, there comes a time where you can't put off your Jericho anymore. Many of us, and we've all experienced it, I mean, maybe there's some of you who are so pure of heart and absolutely ready to do the right thing all the time. Um, but uh, for the rest of us normal people, um, we all have those Jerichos, those fortified places, even in our own lives, that we don't let anybody touch, we don't let anybody see, we don't tell anybody about them. But there comes a time where the Lord wants to Tear down those walls. Now Jericho. Not tomorrow, Jericho. Not can't we do this some other time, Jericho. Not do we really have to talk about it, Jericho. Not can't someone else do this, Jericho. But now Jericho. Now Jericho is something I want to talk to you about this morning. Because Jericho has to be faced. You have your Jericho. We all have our Jerichos. For some of us, Jericho is just plain fear. I know some of you are, are strangled by fear, are, are just tied up with anxiety right now. I know that. Worry. Depression has come into your life. Fear about what's going to happen next. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. No one went out. No one came in. That's what Jericho was like. And the Lord said to Joshua, this is a continuation now, this is Jesus talking to him, saying, see, and, and I want you to see it in exactly the way the Lord's saying it. I have given Jericho into your hand. He's not saying, if you're a good boy, I'll let you have this. He's not saying, you know, if the people are, are good, I'll, I'll let it happen. He's saying, it's already yours. Not just the city, it's king and all of its Mighty men of valor. Mighty men of valor. Can't, you, can't we have the, the wimps and the mighty wimps? Do we have to have mighty men of valor? Because this sounds like a big fight that, that we're going to have, but it is. But if you look at it, and I shouldn't spend so much time on it, and I won't, but just hear the word. Because when, when, when someone uses, especially when God uses the word shall, that's a command. You shall do this. He's not saying if you'd like to, you could do this but you shall do this. He says, behold, I have given Jericho into your hand. I've given you its king and all of its mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do for six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Um, this is not, you know, I, I know I've joked about this before, but you really have to think about this. We, are, we, we, we in many ways feel like we're so familiar with what happens here. We don't like many passages in the Bible, maybe we just completely blow past how absolutely unlikely this is, how absolutely impossible this is, how absolutely ludicrous this is. And, and you know, this is not a, uh, these are not instructions that would survive a board meeting. I mean, I, I can't imagine having, you know, my weekly elders meeting with the guys, you know, on Zoom 
and saying, well, this is what we're going to do with our financial challenges right now as we go through this coronavirus problem. Um, we're we're going to we're going to walk around the shopping center six times. We're going to get all the people out. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to be um, social distanced, and we're all going to walk around this. No one's going to say a word, you know, but I'll have the worship team up front, and I don't want them playing any guitars or anything, but if anybody can, can blow a ram's horn, I think Andrew can do that. I'll give him one of my ram's horns out of, out of my office, and he can blow that thing. And, but no one can say a word. We'll just do it once a day. We'll go home. We'll come back tomorrow morning. We'll do it again every single day for six days. But then on, on the seventh day, then we'll do it seven times. And, and I know they would think, well, he has totally flipped his dipper. Like, what, what is the problem with John? He's just been in front of a camera way too long to think that you know, something like this can happen. What is Joshua thinking? This is a general. He knows how to fight. What are his generals thinking when he, when he communicates? This is the stuff I, I think about all the time. He, you must stay quiet while you're doing this. And for those of you who, you know, who, who are like, you know, real Bible students in the sense that you know, you know a lot of details about the law, you know that this doesn't even square up with what the law says. Like you're not allowed to take the ark into battle. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, the priests are not supposed to carry the ark. The, you know, the, the Kohathites are supposed to carry the ark. They're not supposed to blow the ram's horn when you carry the ark. It's supposed to be the silver horn. I mean, there's all these different things. You never do this on the Sabbath. And yet, seven days, they're, they're doing this. You know, that's a study for other people at a different time. Now, you want to think about this, because it says, this is what you're going to do, and now he tells the people what they must do. And now they're marching. You know, we, we see this, that um, they, they, they march around each time, uh, you know, each one of these days, uh, and it came to pass, verse 15... Actually, let me just read it here. Verse 13. Uh, uh, Joshua rose early in the morning. The priests took up the ark, the seven priests bearing seven trumps of ram's horns. Before the ark of the Lord went on continually, they blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And on the second day, they marched around the city once, they returned to camp, and they did this for, for six days. Um, this may not make a bit of difference to you, but, you know, I, I tried to do a little bit of math today about this because um, I believe the number is uh, 601,730 um, men of fighting age. In other words, from age 20 and up. That's what we read in Numbers 26 about the, the population of, uh, of the nation. And, and so, and, and if you read the commentators, you know, some taters are more common than others. But, but uh, this, there's all kinds of ideas. Did they really need 600,000 men go out and march? And you know, Did they really do that? I don't know, but I, I just did a little math. And if you have, uh, if, if have 600,000 fighting men walking anywhere from 5 to 10 abreast, about 3 feet apart, at, at a 15-minute mile, after all, they're in good shape, they're soldiers, and, and they go out and they do this. From two-mile march from Gilgal to Jericho, they circle it, then they come back. By the time these guys are coming back, others are still leaving the camp. If they do this for 12 hours, you're going to go through at least a half a million men in that time. So yeah, it's absolutely reasonable they would have done that. And, and think about it from the standpoint of someone in Jericho whose heart is melting who is freaking out by the fact that these people have done all these things, they've heard all these stories, and now here they are marching around. For years I used to think about this and think, they were just making fun of them from the walls. Well, maybe someone did, but I suspect they were a little bit more terrified than that. But no one's allowed to say anything. What does that marching do? <laughs> you read some of the commentators, they've got all kinds of ideas about why the walls came down. Some people say, the, you know, all that stomping from all that marching shook, you know, the mortar in the walls. You know, you can laugh about this, but, but people with lots of letters after their name believe these things. I don't have enough letters after my name, so I don't. But uh, they, they believe this kind of thing. Or the, uh, the frequency of the ram's horns is what shook the mortar, and that's why the rocks finally came down. Ludicrous. No, God brought the walls down when he wanted to bring the walls down. But in the meantime, why did God want them? Is there some magic formula here? That's not a magic formula. And if there is, only God knows that, so let's not even speculate. 
God likes us to wait. Not because he's trying to torment us, because he wants us to see the impossibility of things. He wants us to know that only he can do this. He wants us to know, I've called you to go do this, now do it, and do it this way. And I will bring the victory. I'm the one who's going to deliver you. I'm the one who's going to destroy the fortification in front of you. I'm the one who's going to give that to you. God wants us to know that we need him, because we do. And we need to learn those things. Times like the ones we're in right now are times to be reminded of that. And think about it. They had those three days before they crossed the Jordan. They had to wait. After they crossed the Jordan, God says, now build two memorials. Remember last week? Two memorials, a public memorial and a private memorial. Each of us has those public memorials, things that many people may know about our lives. We could say, look what God did in our lives. But we all have those private memorials that we may not share with anybody on the outside, maybe just a few people in a family circle or in a marriage or those kinds of relationships. And now he wants them to remember the things that they learned in those three days on the eastern side of the Jordan. He wants them to remember those memorials, those, those piles of rocks that they built on the, on the bank of the river and also that was underneath the water. He wants them to remember that he had them rest for at least whatever it was, seven days, let's say, uh, after circumcision, and they rested and they healed up and they worshipped. And now in the Six days and then the seventh, as they march around this city, you know, you would have known every rock in those walls by then. And those of you who knew about Rahab, who saw that red cord hanging from the window, you can't say a word. All you know is the walls are coming down, and you'd like to be able to communicate with her. Get out of there. The walls are coming down. But you have to trust the Lord. God wants them to see every rock to see the impossibility of these things. I don't know what has you paralyzed today. As, you, as you're in fear, you look at the things that are going on in your life. I don't know what has staggered you as you look at the walls that you've built up for yourself, maybe. Or the walls may be in a relationship in someone else's life. The walls that say, I can't go further. I don't know what else to do with my life. God wants to remove those walls. He wants them to come down. Incidentally, did you see what he said? I have given Jericho into your hands. What is your Jericho? Because he has given it into your hands. But he wants us to trust him. He wants you to trust him. If I could ask, what has you walking around in circles? You keep seeing this walled fortification there. And you just can't do anything about it. God can. God will. God desires to. And of course, you know the rest of the story. That finally on the seventh day, they walked around seventh time, and finally, at the seventh time around, they did exactly what the Lord said. He didn't say, say hallelujah. He didn't say to do anything except shout. And when they shouted... The walls came down. The archaeologist Spade has proven it. That the walls lie to the outside. They fell to the outside. They didn't use battering rams so that they fell to the inside. They fell to the outside. God did this. God wants to do that in your life. He wants to bring down those fortifications, those walls that are in our lives. And of course he did that, and Rahab and her family were saved. One last thing I want to revisit here. You and I so easily look at these things as just another Bible story. If I could remind you, Jericho was spiritual warfare. You are in the midst of a spiritual battle right now. I'll remind you what, what I said earlier so often when we think of spiritual warfare, we think of weird stuff that Hollywood has shown us. Demon possession. And, and I'm not suggesting that those things don't happen. But what I will tell you is that most of the time, that's not the issue. And people, you know, I'm not going there now, but people love to talk 
sometimes. Christians love to talk about demons and, and all those things. We don't need to be Satan's press agent. But the reality is that he's given you victory. God has given you victory in your Jericho. He's given you victory. It's the devil. It's his demons who want you to believe it's impossible. It's impassable. You'll never get through this. You'll never get past it. God says, I've given it into your hand. I've invited you into the land of promise. And think about this. Here are the Israelites in the land of promise. But they'll never experience the abundance that God has promised to them in the land of promise unless they obey. Unless they're willing. Uh, We see it in terms of circumcision. But unless they're willing to, as Paul puts it in Ephesians 3, to bow the knee before the Lord, to recognize in humility, you are God. It's not just a matter of, of, of walking the sawdust trail and saying, oh, I, I, I believe that Jesus is my, my king, but rather to bow the knee and humbly accept not only is he your savior, but that he's Lord of your life. To to humble yourself before the Lord, and then to walk a holy walk before the Lord. Paul says so many times in in his epistles that we're to walk worthy of the calling, the, the calling that God has placed upon our lives. And then to be prepared for the battle that comes. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Don't just think, you know, I, I'm okay, I'm, I'm saved, and I have a bumper sticker to prove it. But, but to put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles. The, all the, all, the, you know, the, all, all the, the silly ideas that he puts into our head, and, and frankly, that we believe. Those things that result in fears that are irrational. But we end up believing him instead of what God says. But on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But what? But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Not politicians. This is not a partisan issue. It's not about that. It's not about politics. It's about principalities, powers, rulers of this dark age, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the high places. Christians have so confused this, and we think that spiritual warfare is some booey-wooey experience. It's not. Sometimes it can be. But in most cases, it's not that at all. It's just the subtleties that we end up accepting hook, line, and sinker. Instead of taking every thought captive and filtering it through the word of God to see what is true and what is not. And that's why we're told to take up the armor of God, to, to have a, our waist girded with the belt of truth. We have to, everything that we do in our lives has to be based on the truth of God's word. The, what, you're fa- what you're facing right now, what we as a, as a church locally are facing right now, has to be filtered through God's truth. What we are facing as a nation has to be filtered through God's truth not through what the CDC or the WHO or any uh, politician has to say, but through God's word, what he has to say. Because we obey him first, to have the breastplate of righteousness on, to have our feet prepared, not with fear to run the other direction, but to be ready with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to share with all those who are perishing. I mean, you start to walk through... This, this is what we're called to do, to take the shield of faith so we can quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. God has called us to walk in faith in what he's called us to do in, in this world right now. The helmet of salvation, to remember all the time, I'm a child of God now because I'm born again, because his blood was shed for me. And the sword of the Spirit, there's two offensive weapons here, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, not the Bible, knowing God's Word and having it integrated with our language. And in all cases, to be praying. Those are the two offensive weapons. And note, there's nothing to protect your butt in this armor. We're not to be running 
from the battle. We're to be running to the battle. God has called us. That's the standard for a Christian. You and I each have a Jericho in front of us right now. It's a very personal thing. Some it's a bigger issue than others. And collectively, I know we have some major Jerichos in front of us. Prayerlessness. Sinfulness. Things that we need to rid ourselves of. Now, I'm not saying we'll be sinless, but, but to get rid of those voluntary sins and to start pushing forward in what God has called us to do. And some watching this right now, you're happy to be able to sit there and to, and to watch something on your computer or on a TV. But have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior? Today is the day, the Bible says. And so as I close here, I'm just, I'm just encouraging you, now's the time. Simply pray, Lord, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for me. I know I'm a sinner. I'm asking you, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I believe that, that you sent Jesus to pay the price for my sins, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again, and he's coming back. Lord, I want to know that I'm saved. You pray that right now. And then call us or, or send us an email. We will get in touch with you, and we will give you what you need to begin your walk with Jesus Christ. Don't let another day pass until you've done that. For the rest of us, understand that Jericho in front of you is real. It's not going away unless the Lord takes it down, and he will if you're willing to follow him. I said last week, just as God told Joshua, you've never traveled this way before, and you have not, nor have I, come this way before. But God has major victories for us ahead, and I believe he has a very exciting time in the history of our nation, in the history of the world, that he's privileged us to be a part of. So let's do this. Let's follow him. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Join us again on, on Thursday as we pray throughout the day. Let's see God take down the walls. Let's see God take down the walls of addiction and immorality and marriages that are breaking up. Let's see God bring the, uh, the prodigals home. Let's see God do these things. And let's see God pour out his spirit on the people around us that we would see them saved. There's a time of great revival right upon us. And God has called you and me to be a part of it. Friends, don't shirk from the battle. Don't be afraid. Follow Jesus Christ. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for this time, for, for your word, Lord, and we ask that you would just continue to, to sow these seeds of your word into our hearts, Lord. For each one of us, Lord, who, who know you, but you know we're in the land of the promise, but maybe we're not experiencing the promises of the land. And Lord, we ask that you would, that you would do that. We know it, it means in some cases that we need to, uh, to confess some sin and to, and to leave it behind us and to move forward in you. Uh, for others, Lord, that it's time to say once and for all, Lord, I yield myself to you. Fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. Walk me into new territories in my life as a Christian. Lord, and for those who never trusted you before until today, may they pray that prayer, Lord. I know I'm a sinner. I ask you, forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus died for me. I want to be born again. Lord, uh, for each one of us, may we grow in you and become the people, the individuals, but also collectively the church you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord, so much for your love for us and all you're doing in our midst right now, what you promise to be doing in the very near future. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.